in getting down to the molecular level, shamans are actually aff- uh, affecting people on that level. And, and that to me is really, I think, the, probably the hardest thing for people to grasp. I mean, maybe if you've experienced it yourself, you can definitely sense and understand it more. Uh, but I think it's just it's, so you got to frame it like in a general understanding. Like first, so we know, like, so this epigenetics, right? So that as far as how malleable the expression of the DNA is, like there's the twin example, and then there's a further example, which is like every cell in your body has the same DNA. And so like your the cells that make your eyeballs are the same DNA as the cells that make your toes. So the reason that it comes out different is epigenetic programming, you know? So that's what allows the cells to differentiate into these different types. And so you could actually like differentiate a cell and then they could use this different kinds of things they do to go backwards, you know? Like I say, take the dolly, the sheep, they took a mammary cell from the mammary gland, you deprogram it, get it back to like a stem cell, and now you can reprogram it and create another sheep. So that is like the range of, gives an example of the range of like the possibilities of you know what is possible with this kind of epigenetic biology, which is at the foundation of all, you know, I don't know, I mean, how far, I don't know what the epigenetics are in a bacteria, you know, and I'd like to learn about that, but it's like, it's a big, big thing, and at least in the animals and the plants, it's a huge factor, and we're just learning about it now, and learning about how uh, life experience, you know, affects that, and what you eat, and how you live, and all the pharmaceuticals and carcinogens that you come across are going to affect your epigenetics and, and, and create situations that would appear like, well, that looks like a genetic disease, like the way that they're, it seems like it has to be genes. And maybe there's a genetic component, but it's the epigenetics that kind of turns it on. And um, so you have that going on. And, you know, like, for example, like the Crohn's disease case, it's like, yeah, okay, there's definitely genetic factors. And you see this like family line where this disease popping up, but sometimes it doesn't pop up. You know, or sometimes it resolves spontaneously. So it's not as simple as, as just, oh, it's a genetic disease. There's something like kind of turning it on and off or there's some threshold that exists. So then you could show how, you know, childhood trauma affects epigenetics. So you could show that like this certain stress of a particular problem like let's say just uh, like leaving them in an or you know orphanage or staying away or like in a more obvious example on a monkey study, taking them away from their mothers, and then seeing the ones that were stayed with their mothers and what's the difference between them? On top of yes, they show a lot of behavioral differences. You know, the one that was uh, traumatized is having difficulty with stress, difficulty with socializing, difficulty with their own emotions, and then the other one is okay, right? And you can show there's epigenetic differences in them. So that trauma was like left an imprint on their system. So then you can show how, so that right there is an example of like how something very simple, like love and caring, or whatever you want to call it, but this mother-child bond that affects the epigenetics. You know, so in other words, this mother didn't study biochemistry, you know, in order to do that. And this idea of the shamanism, like, you know, to be able to do to affect the biochemistry would be like so outlandish. And then the psychotherapist, they're showing that certain psychotherapy also alters epigenetics, like through the support and this care. And so there's a lot of evidence that this biochemistry is sensitive to a lot of different things, including meditation. So altered states of consciousness, they could show lead to epigenetic shifts. So the epigenetics is quite like sensitive to relationships, to states of consciousness. So these are just facts, you know, um, of, of modern scientific research. This is not like going outside of the box at all. This is what the research is showing us. And so then the shaman could influence this or try to influence this uh, type of energy 
is kind of like it would just it's quite possible in fact you know looking at all the evidence so i think it's just kind of like we don't without knowing those other things it seems so crazy you know but as you start learning more about the, the reality and the possibilities it's like it's not that it's a proven fact at all but it's like huh that's maybe that's possible and so that's why right now um because of that so and you know what like as far as what i received in the visions from the ayahuasca it was basically the message that hey joe you're trying to help this lady with her migraines and you know i just want to let you know that her problem is not in her genes it's on her genes you know and that was like the the metaphor or the image or the vision of the dragon like swimming over her kind of chromatin as i put it in the book and so, you know, a lot of revelations of science have come through dreams and whatever spontaneous thoughts. And so, again, that's another, like, you know, reality. That's like a consistent phenomenon in human history that people, uh, that's like the nature of the imagination. You know, it's like, are we going to deny that people like write new songs that they never heard before? And it's like what, you know, so it's like creativity and imagination. I don't know. There's all this, all this compartmentalization, you know? So any which way, no matter how I receive the idea, what it did in this case, yes, it was from the ayahuasca. And, but anyways, it's an idea that kind of motivated me. And, and it was partially motivated with, because Ricardo, the shaman that I trained with, you know, we're talking all, we're seeing all these problems and I was realizing like, wow, what are the kind of problems that we're helping people with and what the Shipibos are talking about that we need to heal the energies of this kind of trauma you know the trauma of like in utero experience ancestral trauma the trauma of like their infancy and their childhood trauma of their adolescence trauma of later in life and all these different stories related to their relationship with their mother or relationship with their father or all these different you know emotional experiences throughout their life and I was just like wow I wonder where that lives in the physiology you know, this, 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 this thing that we're going after, like, where does emotional trauma live in the body? And I'm sure there's elements of it that exist in the brain, you know, and, and there it is. But in the case of this monkey study, they showed like this epigenetic changes from the imprint of the trauma were found like not just in the brain, but also in immune cells, you know, in white blood cells that are kind of like, to me, interestingly enough, would be kind of participants in this emotional body. The different elements of the emotional body would be marked. And so that's kind of, you know, what led me to think that. And so I was trying to see what, you know, what would be a part of physiology that would address and encompass like all these different times of life and these different relationships. And I saw this growing body of evidence that epigenetics would be something that you see in utero trauma like imprinting epigenetically, childhood trauma, imprinting epigenetically, not just in the brain, but in other parts of the body. And so then you see that kind of stuff. I saw, I was like, wow, they're talking about epigenetics in relationship to migraine. And they're talking about it in relationship to, to a maladaptive stress response. Like there is research around that. And there is research around in Crohn's disease that there's epigenetic factors contributing. And that they, yes, that we see, do a, I see a lot of psychological issues a lot of Crohn's cases that doesn't get talked about that much when they just get sent to the gastroenterologist. And, uh, and then I was seeing this, this chronic cough case, you know, where I was like, oh, they, they were talking about, you know, these epigenetic shifts around that. And like this idea once more that I brought up in the book of a neurogenic inflammation, that there was this inflammation that is be, that has been, you know, witnessed and identified that is coming straight from the nervous system to generate this inflammation, not because there's an insult, not because there's an infection or a trauma, a physical trauma, but because something's wrong in the system. So this is like, this was a psycho neuroimmunologic phenomenon that you saw like this neurogenic inflammation causing Crohn's disease, this neurogenic inflammation underneath this chronic cough that wasn't getting better, neurogenic inflammation underneath this uh, migraine headache. And so it's like, okay, so we've got this smoldering problem that seems to be related to this emotional issue because once you resolve the emotional issue and clean out the energy, so to speak, as we talk about it in the Shipibo terms, and it's like, well, how else maybe should we even talk about it? 
and, and you know, releasing what you'd call emotional baggage, you know, like the way somebody would grieve and have a, a relief from grieving, you know, exactly that, or a relief from a heartfelt forgiveness, you know, between them and their, let's say their brother, you know, that experience that is a very real life experience and the way that like their psychology would improve and maybe even their physiology. And so that led me to kind of go down that road and that's culminated in maps agreeing to, and we're raising money right now through modernspirit.org to collect saliva samples on people in the PTSD trial and do epigenetic research on the MAPS trial, which is showing like unprecedented, you know, success with this PTSD using MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And so then that's my theory is like, wow, these people had such severe problem that was affecting their psychology and all these other aspects of their health. They go through this treatment where undoubtedly they go through this major like emotional experiences and have all the support through the psychotherapy. And then afterwards they are cured you know, a number of them. And it's lasting like for years afterwards. So something changed, you know, something changed. And so that's like a physiologic kind of phenomenon. And it would seem like the evidence is pointing to the epigenetics would be one area that we know is sensitive to emotional interaction, is sensitive to states of consciousness. They could possibly be, you know, what responds and then leads to this lasting change. So that's been my, like, you know, that's what I've been talking about a lot. And that's kind of one of the major point, you know, one of the points of the book. And so it's culminated in this trial and this research. So we're trying to raise money to, we have enough money to start collecting samples once the paperwork goes through. And then we'll need more money to do the lab work, you know, to actually run the epigenetics studies, which are expensive. You know, that's one thing that's limiting this kind of exploration. Right. 